Good evening and welcome to the services of Newton Baptist Church. I am so excited that you're with us. Uh, as a child, and maybe even as an adult, have you ever played the game Hide, Go, Seek? Hide and Go, Seek. Um, you know, it's like, where are you? Where are you? And you're trying to find them, trying to find them, trying to find them. And as a, as a child, the game was pretty fun. Now, I wasn't very good at it. I always got found. Um, but uh, as an adult, what about when we're trying to find God? Are you there, God? I mean, are you, are you around? And as we're going through in the book of Psalms, uh, we hit Psalm chapter 13. And this evening, I love what John Phillips, he's gone home to be with the Lord now, but was just a, a great man of God and just has some very powerful commentaries. Let me read what he wrote about this psalm. He says, man's extremity is God's opportunity. When we are at our wit's end, without resources, a loss for a way, perplexed and desperate, that is usually when we see God begin to work in a powerful way. But before he does anything about our situation, he wants to do something about ourselves. And that is where we begin to hedge. We want God to deal with our complication, but God wants to develop our character. We want him to change our circumstances. He wants to change us first. That is why he allowed the circumstances. We cry, hurry up, Lord. And he says, it's your move. I won't move until you do. And that's what this little psalm is all about. We at Psalm chapter 13 with David, uh, some think that he was going through uh, maybe some physical uh, challenges in his life. Uh, many believe that uh, once again, uh, being pursued by Saul and you know all that that entailed, that that's what David is lamenting about and talking about when it comes to enemies. And so this psalm is one of those that breaks up just really, really nicely. And it's going to go in two verse segments, verses 1 and 2, verses 3 and 4, and then verses 5 and 6. And uh, if you want to write down an outline in the, the chapter of Psalms there, chapter 13, you can see the first two verses, David's despair, David's despair. And it's, it's going to use an ex exclamation, how long, O Lord, how long, how long, how long? And then verses 3 and 4, not only David's despair, Notice David's desire, David's desire. He's like, you know, if this were to happen, you know, would this, would this uh, benefit you? Would it glorify you? And the, there's a word, less. Like the first section was, you know, how long? And then L-E-S-T, if this were to happen, Lord. And he shares his desire about wanting to serve God. And so we're going to start off with his despair. And then we hit desire, and then verses 5 and 6, we see his delight. And only a God in heaven, having the right perspective as a believer, can you and I go from despair to delight. And so the title of the message, are you there, God? Are you there, God? Uh, look with me in verse 1. Verse 1, how long wilt thou forget me, O Lord, forever? How long wilt thou hide thy face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long for the fourth time shall mine enemy be exalted over me? Verse 3, consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Lighten mine eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death, lest mine enemies say I prevailed against him, and those that trouble me rejoice when I am moved. But I have trusted. Now notice this transition. And in all of our lives, we're going to face despair and challenges. Um, speaking with people yesterday and even this morning, the challenges that they're going through, the news that they're being given. And so despair could easily be a part of your life this evening. It'd be a part of my life. But we want to go from the despair to the delight. And so notice he says, but I, but, but, the conjunction there, the change, the transition, but, verse 5, but I've trusted in thy mercy. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. I will, I will sing unto the Lord because he hath dealt bountifully with me. There was one man that said uh, to me, he said very well, this song or psalm, a psalm is a song. This song, as it were, cast up constantly lessening waves. And what he means that, by that is, in the beginning you've got this tsunami that is barreling down at us. And as you go through the psalm, there is a tranquility and a peace that happens within the soul. This song, as it were, cast up constantly lessening waves until it becomes still 
as the sea when smooth as a mirror. And the only motion discernible at the last or the end of the psalm is that of the joyous ripple of calm repose. And so maybe in your life you're despairing. You know, God, where are you during this event? Or God, where are you uh, during that event? Or, or through all this pandemic? Or t- maybe we could, we could just lump 2020 all together and like, hey, God, where are you? And uh, you know what? He brings a peace in our despair. He brings a, a delight to our dilemma. And so we look at David and we see all this going on. And I like this. When God seems distant, now are you listening? Thanks. When God seems distant, we must call to Him and trust in His unfailing love. So you may feel like, wow, I'm in despair. God seems distant. Um, Maybe you don't feel like your prayers are being heard and answered. Maybe your devotional life has gone a little stale or cold, and you feel like God's distant. When God seems distant, because David feels like God is distant. Did you hear the way in verses 1 and 2? How long, how long, how long, how long? Four times, four times. How long, Lord? The despair, the distance. And uh, when God seems distant, we must call to Him and trust in His unfailing love. And so he says, how long? Without thou forget me. Have you ever felt forgotten by the Lord? Forgotten by other people? Just forgotten, forgotten, forgotten. And during this, uh, during, during this time of quarantine, isolation, as we've progressed through that, you know, there are people that feel like they've been forgotten, forgotten. And he says, how long will thou forget me, O Lord? Forever? Forever? I mean, you know, is this going to go on forever, Lord? How long will thou hide thy face from me? Not only, not only how, do I feel like I've been forgotten, I feel like I've been forsaken. How long are you going to forget me? How long are you going to hide your face from me? And then verse 2, how long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? This is uh, his, his, now, now thoughts of worry have inundated him. He's looking inside himself for answers instead of God. Notice the wording there. Take counsel in my soul. If you and I don't control our thoughts and the things that go through our mind, you can find your life shipwrecked in a very brief amount of time when you start taking counsel within your own soul rather than taking counsel with the scriptures. And it's like, well, preacher, I just can't figure it out. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm finding out it's not a matter of you and I figuring it out. It's a matter of you and I trusting God. And so he takes counsel within his own soul. When I'm discouraged and depressed, the answer is not looking inside myself. It is looking to the Lord. Uh, you are probably very familiar with a lady by the name of Corey Tinboom. And uh, the life, and if you've never read about her life, oh, just a staggering woman, a true woman of faith. I read this quote, and I want to share it with you. If you look at the world, you will be distressed. If you look within, you will be depressed. But if you look at Christ, you'll be at rest. And I thought, wow, that has a lot of meat to it. You know, God knows how long your trials are going to last. God knows what's going to go on in the trials of life because God knows what He wants to accomplish. God knows exactly what is needed in my life, and God knows exactly what is needed in your life. First Peter 1, verses 6 through 8. First Peter 1, 6 through 8. Wherein you greatly rejoice, though, though now for a season, if need be, and I would underline if need be, because sometimes we need, I need, to be in those challenging times. If need be, you're in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found in a praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Verse 8, whom having not seen you love, and whom, though now you see him not yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of of glory. And so we look at this and David's like, how long, how long, how long? Forever, O Lord? And he, a lot of despair there, a lot of despair there, a lot of anguish within his soul, a lot of questions within his mind. And maybe you're dealing with that as well. Uh, I read it, it always seems as if uh, a time of intense trial will last forever. Uh, the hardest thing about waiting, there you go, is that you have to wait. 
I don't like waiting rooms. Don't like, I just don't like waiting, don't like waiting, don't like waiting. There was a great man of God by the name of Philip Brooks. And uh, it really is temperament according to history and, and, and readings and all. He was a very calm man. He was a very peaceful man. Uh, but one day he was with a friend and it was documented that he is roaming about like a, like a lion that is caged. And it was really unusual for, for Preacher Brooks. And uh, his friend looked at him and says, are you okay? Are you okay? I want to read back his response because when I read this, it brought a smile upon on my face and in my soul because I, I can hear and I probably have heard myself saying something like the same way. And so he says, what's, what's wrong? What's the trouble? And uh, Mr. Brooks replied back, the trouble is I'm in a hurry and God isn't. <laughs> Did you get that? He said, I'm in a hurry and God isn't. And so we look at Psalm chapter 13 and David's like, how long, how long, how long, how long? David David's in a hurry, but God isn't. And you go all through the Bible. Remember, we were in the book of Genesis. And you remember Joseph. Wow. He got these uh, dreams, and he was going to be exalted, and his family was going to bow down and worship him, and God was going to use him just in a mighty, mighty, powerful way. And then there was a progression of about, what, 13 years, 14 years, uh, that God was building and building and building, and he was put in a pit. He was sold into slavery. Um, he was accused wrongly by Potiphar's, uh, and, uh, Potiphar because of Potiphar's wife that said that he had tried to be, uh, well, he tried to rape her. I mean, just lies and imprisonment. So he gets in the jail, and uh, the baker and the butler of Pharaoh come, and they have a dream, and Joseph gives them the dream. And all he says is, hey, guys, remember me. Just remember me. Remember me. And so the baker, you remember, was hanged and killed, but the the butler was restored. The butler forgot all about Joseph. And all Joseph said was, remember me. You remember in Genesis 41, verse 1, it says this, And it came to pass at the end of two full years uh, that Pharaoh dreamed, and behold, he stood by the river. And this is when Joseph's going to be bought, brought before Pharaoh because of his dream. And the wording there that just captures my attention, it says, as it, at, at the end of two full years. Well, he's like, well, I don't, I don't know what the big deal. Well, the big deal is that's two full years, 365 days, twice. Where's the word from God? Where's documented history? Where's the, the, the relevant events of uh, Joseph's life? I mean, they're, 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 they are just quiet day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, after two full years. And maybe that's where you are today. Maybe it's just the regular hours that turn into days, that's weeks, that's months, that's years, after full year, two full years. And so waiting on the Lord, trusting the Lord, you know, He's not left you, He's not abandoned you, He's not forsaken you, He's not forgotten you. But you and I, we feel so much despair in our life because it seems like nothing is happening. I, I, I'm learning this. When I don't think anything's happening, there's a lot happening. I just can't see it. And so with Joseph's life, God was working. Paul, you know, Paul put into prison. And it's some of the same wording for Paul in Acts 24, 27. But after two years, um, Festus was, it came unto Felix's room. And Felix, willing to show the Jews a pleasure, left Paul bound. Basically, he's talking about Paul being bound for two years there. Um, after two years. So you're in a time dilemma. Uh, you feel despair. You feel like the Lord's forgotten you. The Lord hadn't forgotten you. Israel felt like that in Isaiah 49, verses 14 and 15. But Zion said, and that's Jerusalem, but Zion said, the Lord hath forsaken me, and my Lord hath forgotten me. Sounds a lot like David, doesn't it? And notice the response. Can a woman forget her suck, suckling child, uh, that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? And he says, can, can a mother forget their child? And the truth is, we know that, you know, they can forget their child, they can abort their child. So we know the answer, and he, and he responds there. Yea, they may forget. A mother may even forget their suckling child, their little baby. They, they may forget that. But understand this, he says, yet will I not forget thee. That's what he told us in Hebrews. He says, I will never leave thee, nor 
forsake thee. Our God loves you. He loves me. His despair. His despair. And now we go to the next two verses. His desire. He says, Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Lighten mine eyes. Uh, Ephesians, Paul adds a little bit of dimension to that. He says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation of the knowledge of Him. Verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling and what the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of His power to us who believe according to the working of His mighty power. And He says, Lord, He says, hear me, lighten mine eyes, give, give part physically, give life and vitality to me, but also spiritually, Lord, give me discernment, help me to see uh, your working that uh, you may do in my life what you would seek to do. Give me the power to see what's going on. Grant me the power to have life. He says, less, that, that I may not go to the grave. Would, would God cause, uh, be helped by David's death? Would God, he's, like, he's like, you know, don't let me go to the grave. Or is your cause going to be helped by my death? Uh, whether it's enemies threatening him or disease overcoming him, he's like, you know, God, is your cause going to be helped by my death? And then verse 4, let my, lest mine enemies say, oh, that they wouldn't be able to say, I, ha I have prevailed against him. And so the first part of verse 3, lest I sleep the sleep of death, God, am I going to bring you more glory by death? Well, is, that is that what it, you're doing? Uh, en enlighten me. Help me to see, God. Are you going to receive more glory by my death? And then he says this, lest mine enemies say I prevailed against him. God, are you going to be glorified by my defeat, David says? Will you be def my death, will you be glorified? My defeat, will you be glorified? Verse 4, he says this, and those that trouble me rejoice when I'm moved. Lord, should our enemies rejoice when believers suffer? Is, it, is this all going to bring you glory? And he sort of lays out these petitions. Our prayers should be consumed with God's glory and not our own. And boy, if we're not careful, we can get caught in that melee there that uh, we're seeking our glory in the name of God, but it, we're seeking our glory, our benefit. We're making it easier on ourselves. The late Dr. Howard Hendricks said this, when you're doing what Jesus Christ has called you to do, you can count on two things and you can stake your life on it. One, you will possess spiritual power because you have the presence of Christ. Two, You'll experience opposition because the devil does not concentrate on secondary targets. He never majors the devil on the minors. When you come to the end of yourself, and that's what really matters, and that's when you really learn, I really learn to trust God. David is having to learn in a deeper and deeper way from faith to faith to faith to trust in God. Then verse 5, and we see a transition going on here. Uh, we're going to see something very, very beautiful from him. We started with despair, and now we're going to, to delight. And uh, he shares his despair and his desire, and now his delight. He says, but I have trusted in thy mercy. Where are you going to lean? Where are you going to go to? Uh, right now, we are being pushed in so many different directions and pulled in so many different directions. Where do you go to? Where do you and I go to? He says, but I have trusted in thy mercy. This is a conscious decision that David is making. It's going to be a conscious decision that you'll need to make. It'll be a conscious decision that I will need to make. Will I trust God? Will I trust in his mercy and his grace in my life? Thomas Edison, um, this, uh, even as a young man, was enamored with this, with this gentleman. He said this, many of life's failures are people who did not realize how close they were to success when they gave up. You're right on the brink of something absolutely amazing. I mean, that's sort of like a Zig Ziglar type of statement. You are so close to something so amazing. And you're going to quit? Back up? Throw in the towel? Oh, my soul. Oh, my soul. It's a conscious decision. And right now, you've got to make a conscious decision that's going to overcome your feelings and your emotions and your despair. And that is, I am going to trust in the mercy, the love, and the grace of my God in heaven. David is trusting God. He says in verse 5, my heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. I'm going to turn my focus and tension from my circumstances to Christ. I am going to make a conscious decision. I am going to take every thought captive into the obedience of Jesus Christ. I am going to go from despair to delight. I am going to consciously take that journey. He says in verse 6, 6, I will sing 
unto the Lord. He said emphatically, I'm making a decision. I will sing to the Lord. I'm going to trust in God. I'm going to think about the things of God. David remembered that God is faithful. Remember, remember, child of God, God is faithful. Regardless of other voices, regardless of other circumstances, God is faithful. And so David remembered. Then David rejoiced. He said, I am going to praise God. I am going to sing. And see, David rededicated. He says, I will. I'm just finding in life that um, a lot of my conscious decisions, planned decisions, faithful decisions, Lord, I will do this. It, not based on my emotions and feelings. If you and I, we are built with a mind, a will, and emotion, uh, it is a very real part of all of our lives. But uh, we need to be sure that it's not our emotions that's running everything in our life up and down and sideways. We make conscious decisions and we do things by faith. And I've told people and told people, uh, I know for my own life it's a challenge at times, but sometimes I have to do things by faith until the feelings catch up. And if I do them by faith, it, 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 sooner or later, it may be sometime is, sometimes or longer than others, but uh, if I do it by faith until the feelings catch up, you know, the feelings catch up when you live by faith. And maybe you need to make some decisions by faith. And the famous preacher Charles Spurgeon was walking through the English countryside with a friend. And Charles Spurgeon noticed on top of a barn there was a weather vane. And some of the kids may not know what that is. You might need to Google it and show them a picture of it. But the weather vane that would show the direction of the wind. And at the top of the vane were the words, God is love. Spurgeon remarked that this was an inappropriate place for such a message because weather vanes are changeable, but God's love is constant. And Spurgeon's friend disagreed. He said this to him, You misunderstood the meaning, Mr. Spurgeon. The weather vane is stating the truth that no matter which way the wind blows, God is love. And so I don't know what direction the winds of your life are blowing, but one of the unchanging things is God is love. Love And David, he got a little bit off balance and off kilter, but he had to stabilize himself that regardless of how the wind was blowing, God is love. And he says, I'm going to praise God, sing to God, rejoice in God. So, you know, um, what do I do with all this? Well, David took his complaint to God directly. And um, could I encourage you? Take your complaint to God directly. Uh, be honest with God. Talk to God. Speak with God. We call it prayer. But that you are pouring your heart out to God. You know, God's not offended by your questions or mine. The Bible says, If any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not. Uh, God, is, God has a, 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 a very patient, open, listening ear for his children. And then seek the fellowship of fellow believers, uh, services in the church, um, ways to uh, minister together, but uh, g gather together uh, that which is safe and that which uh, you have peace with. Uh, there needs to be now a coming back together into the house of God and our rejoicing and singing and worshiping together. Um, being in the worship services will help do something for you. Help another believe, uh, hear another believer sing. Well, it will do something for you. Uh, take time to minister to other people. Get beyond what's going on in your life and look and see how you can minister in the lives of others. And David went from despair to delight. Just a beautiful, beautiful short song, but it's beautiful how God was working within his heart and life. As he's, he, he's talking and praying through this whole psalm, uh, he's like, Lord, how, how long have I got to suffer with this pain, disease, challenge within my life? How long, Lord, before my prayer is answered and he's pouring his life out to God? Father, he's like, give me some relief in my life. Help me to remain steadfast in my faith. Help me to praise you for your salvation. God, let me sing of your mercies in my life. And so this psalm is a song, and David is singing it to the, the Lord, and he's going from despair to delight, and it's amazing. You may start off with the mully grubs, that the more you praise God and sing to the Lord, you'll find that it will minister to your heart and life. There was an old hymn that said this, Be not dismayed, whate'er be time, God will take care of you. Beneath His wings of love abide, God will take care of you. Through days of toil when heart doth fail, 
God will take care of you. When dangers fierce your path assail, God will take care of you. All you may need, He will provide. God will take care of you. Nothing you ask will be denied. God will take care of you. No matter what may be the test, God will take care of you. Lean, weary one, upon his breast, for God will take care of you. And then the chorus, God will take care of you through every day or all the way. He will take care of you. God will take care of you. And so David looks to him and he's like, how long, O Lord, where are you? And it's like God looked down and said, David, I'm taking care of you. God has not left you, forgotten you, or forsaken you. May you have just a sweet divine awareness of His presence in your heart, home, and life. If you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, could I lovingly ask you, may today be the day of salvation, that you would place your faith and trust in His death and burial and resurrection. And if you need help with that decision, maybe you don't feel comfortable praying on your own, there's a connection card and a way to get in touch with uh, our church staff or one of our spiritual leaders within our church family, and they will help you as you would say to the Lord Jesus Christ, I know that I have sinned. I know that I've fallen short of your glory. I know that I cannot get to heaven on my own. And right now I confess my sin and place my faith and trust totally in what you've done, Jesus Christ, in your death, burial, and resurrection. I place my faith in you. God in heaven wants you and I to be saved, born again. He wants to have a relationship with us. He wants to take care of us, not only in the eternity to come, but in the earthly here. God wants to move and work in your heart and within your life. How long, O oh Lord? And he looks back down and says, whatever length of time it may take, because I care for you. May God strengthen you and bless you in a powerful way. For we ask God in heaven to move in your life. We pray, Father, that you would have your hand upon each and every one. Our heart is stirred to prayer for those that do not know you as Savior. Our heart is stirred to prayer for those that are going through difficult days. Stirred, Lord, right now for those that are going through challenging times. Oh, they are looking and saying, where is God? And God, you're right there. Show them and give them an awareness of your love and your presence. They, as they make conscious decisions, that they will praise the Lord. May you honor that and bless that in each and every life. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Again, there's a connection card there. If you would fill it out on your screen, it'll help us to be able to help you take your next step for the Lord Jesus Christ. I love you, and I look forward to us getting together again next Sunday. God bless your hearts.